Well, hello uh, and welcome to tonight's webinar on Will the World Cooperate? I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, the building you can see behind me, and we're delighted to have you all participating in tonight's discussion. Um, we'll be running for one hour and it's a huge pleasure to have Dr. Ngozi okonji weala and Professor Adam Tooze with me and I'm going to introduce them in more detail in a moment. The world needs to cooperate. We're dealing with a pandemic which has now caused huge economic distress in most countries of the world. So the world is going to have to cooperate both on the health side and on the economic side to ensure that countries can grow out of this crisis instead of crashing out of this crisis. And yet at right just this moment when the world needs to cooperate, we're seeing a hotting up of the conflict between the United States and China a strategic rivalry of two powers that are competing over control of markets, control of technology, control of the rules of the game, which has been spiraling into something more than a strategic rivalry and is making very difficult cooperation along the lines that the world has gotten used to since 1990 and the end of the Cold War. During, today, during tonight's session, we're going to look at why, what do we most need the world to cooperate on at the moment? Not a wish list of all the things, but what are the absolutely important things given how difficult cooperation is? We're going to look at where cooperation is actually taking place, which you might not see behind the headlines, which are always about politicians yelling at one another. And then we're gonna look at where might the world be in two years time? Where might international relations be? So the first person I'm going to come to with tonight's questions is Dr. Ngozi Okonjiweala. And Ngozi at the moment kind of embodies the ambition of the world to cooperate. Not only is she chair of Gavi and of course has a, a, a long background as finance minister in Nigeria, as managing director in the World Bank, but just in the last month, as institution after institution has realized they must cooperate, they have of course turned to Dr. Okonji Wiala. She's just been appointed the World Health Organization's special envoy for their access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. She's just been appointed to South Africa's economic advisory group for dealing with the crisis. She's been made a member of the IMF's external advisory group and is a special envoy for the African Union on coronavirus. So Ngozi, you're just sitting at the heart and you're holding the world together for us, I hope. So, so where do we most need to cooperate and where is the best cooperation happening? Thank you, Naira. I, um, I wouldn't presume at all to be holding the world. <laughs> it's much too tricky. Um, but I think that um, there's a realization that we most need to cooperate on health because of this pandemic. And it's for obvious reasons, because the virus does not know about global economic tensions. It doesn't know boundaries. And everyone realizes that um, as long as there's a weak link somewhere, a country that hasn't got a handle on this or an individual who has it, the likelihood of it being passed to others, given the global interconnectedness is huge. So this is one around which the world would rally. And despite all the appearances of tension on the part of some countries, there's cooperation going on. Where is that? I think one is around this ACT Accelerator. This is the whole project to try and bring the world around the finding solutions to COVID-19. And there are three work streams on that. One is obviously on vaccines, which most people uh, tend to hear about. The, the, how are we going to find vaccine or vaccines that we can develop, manufacture at scale and deliver to all countries. The second is around therapeutics. What if we don't find a vaccine or somehow you get it, how do we cure this? So there's cooperation around finding the right medicines. And the third is around diagnostics. We still haven't got the best ways of diagnosing and testing for this, and there's still a race on to find the appropriate tools. All countries have come behind this, and even the United States, there's cooperation going on within 
NIH, the National Institutes of Health, the CDC. So at the scientific level, this is going on and many people may not know it. Sorry. So when we see in the headlines that President Trump has withdrawn funding from the World Health Organization, that it's, that it's being used as a scapegoat um, by governments, how seriously is that actually affecting cooperation from where you sit? I, I don't think it's, a, it's a too bad, uh, uh, Nairia, and I'll tell you why. Because from the point of view of the private sector, uh, they're certainly participating in this accelerator, and they, they and the scientific community are the ones who are working on the vaccines and the therapeutics and diagnostics. And at the scientific level, they are all cooperating, they are talking to each other, they're all desirous of finding something that can be used globally. So I can, I can categorically say that. So whilst the rhetoric at the political level may seem hot, really at the scientific level, it's going on. A second area of cooperation that has even uh, both at political and scientific level, uh, uh, it, it, uh, everybody working together is also with Gavi. In a few days on, on June 4th, Gavi is going to have its fourth replenishment of 7.4 billion. And this is designed to bring the world to focus not only on COVID-19, but also on other infectious diseases. We must not take our eyes off that ball because in DRC, whilst we were fighting Ebola, two and a half times more people died of measles than died of Ebola. So the world is coming together on June 4th around routine other infectious diseases, and the US is part of it. China is part of it. Everybody is part of it because we realize how serious this is. This is not well known to the world, but this is another uh, area in which cooperation is going on. And finally, I want to say one thing I'm really proud of. There's cooperation within the African continent in a way I never saw it before. Great unity of purpose to rally around and make sure all countries have what they need. The African Union has created a platform for logistics, for buying test kits, for buying equipment that countries can visit. It will be launched in a week's time. And all countries can go there to find what they need because the race to get these equipment is worldwide and they're being locked out. The second thing is a fund to help pay for this and to help support the African Centers for Disease Control and National Centers for Disease Control. And that fund, 350 million Africans have already contributed 60 million of their own money. So that kind of unity is one that is just uh, fantastic. So it's not all gloom and doom. The world is coming together. Regions are coming together around certain things. That's terrific. And, and Gozi, one last word. Where is it that cooperation is not happening where you would most want it to? If you had a magic wand and could make countries cooperate, what, what's the one thing that you think most desperately needs that magic? I would like to see more cooperation on the economic front because this pandemic actually hit developing countries first as an economic crisis before the health crisis arrived. And although I see willingness to cooperate, I mean, the EU, uh, the G20 actually opened the door to a moratorium or it, it stands still on debt that the African continent had been looking for. Um, but the rhetoric, I think, moves further than the actual deeds. And so I think if the world doesn't cooperate on the economics, you might find some countries left behind, and that's not to the advantage of any other country. And you were for, for a number of years managing director of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that debt moratorium, which is quite modest for the countries concerned, is there a way, what, what would you be doing at the bank? Is there a way to, to sweat its balance sheet to get the bank to take a little more risk to, to get the bank to carry a little more load on this? Well, uh, yes, I think there, there are a couple of things. First of all, the moratorium that has been granted is only till the end of this year and does not in, involve a multilateral debt. It's for bilateral and the private sector is being coaxed to come along with some difficulty. So we want that to be a two year standstill because we think this crisis is going to be much longer and African countries and other developing countries may need that time to look at their debt sustainability and reprofile debt or get some written off. 
So for the World Bank and the, the IMF has already, to some extent, forgiven some given debt relief to the poorest countries, of which 19 are, Afri are African, for 198 million. The World Bank, I think, can do uh, maybe a couple of things. I think the most important is if it cannot do the moratorium, because they say this will hit their balance sheet and their credit rating, it can certainly provide fresh resources. And that's what many of the multilaterals want to do. So we're asking them to front load resources uh, uh, to help the countries. It's either you give the debt relief or you provide fresh money and provide it quickly. So they've given about 14 billion in commitments to African countries, for example, we want that to go to 35 billion within the next six months. And they seem able and willing to do that. Of course, they want another supplemental IDA, which is the concessional arm of the bank the world to come around and support them with more money for that. And we, we are behind that. Mm. So, so the way you say uh, they say they can't makes me think you think they can. And having been managing <laughs> director of the organization, I would trust your judgment on that. But you, you think they actually can do more on debt relief? Well, you know, it's the fear of the credit rating agencies. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody is in terror or being terrorized by these credit rating agencies. And I must say something on that. Look, we are in unprecedented times. It's not business as usual. Well, credit rating agencies are carrying on business as usual. Mm -hmm. I mean, we must recognize that countries are dealing with something they haven't dealt with before and they have, must have regulators and credit rating agencies need to get together and talk about some kind of forbearance for the times. It's because of this that the multilateral organizations are running scared because they think that if they sweat their balance sheet a bit more, look at their loan equity ratios to see if there's more they can do there, this will draw the attention of the credit rating agencies. So I think there's something really nire that needs to be fixed there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me on that note, bring in Adam Tooze. And by the way, to the audience, you have a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Someone just used it. I'm not the only one that gets to ask questions. Please fire in your questions and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that you get some answers during this discussion. I'd like to bring in Adam Tooze. Adam's book, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World, is, is simply one of the best books I've read. Um, and in that book, Adam, you tell us about the way the dense swap lines, that's to say the way the Federal Reserve in the United States lends to other central banks. I think you say saved Europe and saved the world during the crisis. This is the kind of cooperation most people don't get to look at and watch. Is that happening at the moment? Yes, it has happened. So um, the, the swap lines are a way of uh, handling the fact that the one of the ways in which the world system is deeply interconnected is that a very large part of global finance and trade is conducted in the dollar, the national currency of the United States. We don't have a global currency. Uh, the closest thing we've got is the SDR, which is the accounting unit and the internal credit unit of the IMF. And in the absence of a global currency, the dollar is the common denominator of much of global trade and finance. But in a crisis like we saw in 2008 and as we saw in March this year, funding in dollars suddenly gets very short and there is then a stark pyramid, a hierarchy forms of uh, banks, agencies, businesses that are more or less able to access dollars, um, very much uh, determined also by the impact of the credit rating agencies that, Dr., uh, that Ngozi was referring to. So. In a moment of crisis like that, the question is, how do you drive dollars out into the into the global system? Um, and if you're a privileged actor, a strong European or Asian bank with a branch in Wall Street in New York, the, the Fed will basically treat you as equivalent to, to an American bank and provide liquidity by means of the liquidity tools that we're all familiar with. But in 2008, they discovered that the European banks, which were at the time the dominant players in the transatlantic system of finance centered us on the dollar, couldn't, didn't have enough good collateral in New York to actually access dollars directly by way of the Fed. And so the Fed repurposed the liquidity swap line system, which had first really been innovated in the 1960s in the, the state, uh, sort of in the desperate effort to maintain the Bretton Woods system 
and repurposed it as a way of providing dollar liquidity to the global financial system, the global banking system, by way of the central banks of Europe and Japan. So, and that became a permanent system. So uh, effectively what it means is that central banks, which are fiat money creators, so they can essentially generate claims in their own currency to an unlimited extent on their accounts by typing on a computer, can access dollars by the same mechanism. In other words, the ECB will credit the Fed with 500 billion euros, and the Fed will credit the ECB with equivalent amount of dollars. And I use that extraordinary number deliberately because from the September of 2008 onwards, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, uh, Swiss National Bank were granted unlimited access to dollars by way of this mechanism. And this was crucial to calming global funding stress in 2008. In 2013, that system became permanent for the core group of central banks that are in the money centers of the global economy, all of whom essentially on demand can draw down dollars on fixed term swaps, which then have just flipped around after three months generally. And that has been, as it were, a key part of the global financial safety net ever since. And, and what was very significant in March this year is that um, as funding stress built once again in the global financial system in the second week of March in particular, 9th of March being the moment really when global financial markets began to panic, the Fed quickly moved to ease the terms on these swap lines and then rolled them out to a group of 14 privileged central banks, which include also um, South Korea, uh, the Bank of Mexico and the Brazilian Central Bank, along with the Central Bank of Singapore, uh, Australia, New Zealand, to build a fairly comprehensive safety net. The question already in 2008, and even more urgently now, is whether that kind of system of dollar liquidity provision for this core group is really adequate to a much more multipolar world. Um, that we live in today. And there are two categories for whom or uh, for whom this is really probably not sufficient. And um, first of all, the large emerging markets that are outside this system uh, and are perhaps in a weak position. So right now, I think we're particularly concerned about Turkey, South Africa for a while as well. And then of course, the low income countries that Ngozi was talking about, who are really in no position to access uh, Fed resources on, on, on terms at all. And so I think what we're, desperately trying to improvise as an extension of that financial safety net uh, to include the totality of the global economy now, which includes very substantial pieces, the Nigerias, the South Africas of this world, huge populations, major pieces of the 21st century puzzle, but not really easily integrated into a spot by network, which literally still stems from the 1960s. In other words, comes out of the Cold War, essentially the Atlantic Alliance plus Japan. And how much is that swap line network, that stable core, which is now being held together by the Federal Reserve, um, a geopolitical one? So are we, are we looking at a world where we've got those countries which are being backed and supported by China versus those that are being backed and supported yeah. by the United States? Tacitly, uh, if you look, I'm a historian, so if you go inside you know, what minutes we can access of the Fed debates, it's quite clear there's in fact a moment either on or off the record where somebody in the Fed says, you know, we're doing geopolitics. We here we ought to check with the State Department. So it is quite clear that one of the criteria for admissions to the core Fed swap line is that you're a trusted partner of the United States. Um, interestingly, Indonesia apparently applied for a swap line this time round and was denied it. We think what the Fed then did was to improvise a so-called repo facility, which is a facility which allows, say, Indonesia, if it wanted to, to borrow against the strength of its treasury holdings. What the Fed is adjusting to is that there are multiple major reserve holders around the world now who all actually have quite a lot of good dollar collateral and the Fed doesn't want them to sell that. And so the Fed needs to provide facilities. But yes, broadly speaking, the existing model, as I was suggesting, follows the outlines of the American core alliance system of the Cold War period. Um, and China has responded to this uh, since 2008 by very, um, proactively building out a swap line network, which includes very large parts of the emerging market world. And the Bank of Japan also, for instance, has been highly innovative, the ECB much less so, but the Bank of Japan, for instance, provides extensive swap line facilities to India, to Indonesia as well. And the Bank of Japan can, of course, access the American system. So there may be some tacit intermediated system, but certainly around the Chinese system extends all the way to the city of London. So. In 2013, when the Cameron government in Britain was pushing very hard to establish the city of London as the new center for renminbi globalization, 
the British government borrowed in Renminbi, which is a major historic first, and then also built up a swap line network. So it's not exclusive. You can be part of the Chinese system and the American system in certain instances, but there are two distinct networks and very little prospect at all, I think, of the People's Bank of China and the Fed entering into an explicit agreement. Um, though some people thought that this new repo facility the Fed opened up might be a way through which the Chinese could access dollars uh, in the Fed. Um, but that you. is untried so far. Thank you, Adam. It's wonderfully clear. Now you, you, you pulled out some historical threads in that explanation. And if I can now pan right back from that system, which is working now, and ask you as an economic historian, should we be drawing parallels from other moments in history? And what are the most important parallels to draw? We're hearing some say that we need to think about ourselves as being at the end of the Second World War, that, that moment in the 1940s when people's lives had come to a stop because of the war and suddenly governments had to play a huge role in the economy and fashion a new kind of international cooperation. Others say this is more like the 1980s with all countries going into a debt crisis and the, and the risk therefore is of huge austerity so that the world actually goes into a recession. Um, or is it 2008? Is it, are we going to see a replay of the financial mm -hmm. crisis of 2008? What, what would you say what should we learn from history? Well, I, I'm the, I think historians fall into two camps. One sort of historian is very keen to remind people who are forgetful about bits of history the historian in question knows about um, and wants to explain how you know, you're naive to imagine that we're in a new world. Another sort of historian which are, to which I cleave really wants us to help us to understand how the modern world is different from the past, um, how we have moved on in very dramatic ways. And I'm decidedly of that opinion. So for me, the best way to think about this is more, say, the evolution of climate politics from a climate politics, which is European and American centered, speaks about the world, but doesn't have the world in it, to a cacophonous climate politics, UN style of the 90s and the Kyoto moment, through to a politics of the G4, which itself is inadequate to our current moment. And the challenge really is to craft a truly multipolar climate politics for the, for the future. I think that's the way to listen to Ngozi. That's the way I hear her describing COVID-19 politics. This has got to be essentially from the bottom up at all levels and all the way down multipolar. Otherwise, this doesn't work. We can't address that this way. The financial system, of course, we should be clear, is profoundly hierarchical and organized around the dollar in a very important way, but is not exclusively so, also has a Eurozone element to it, and also, of course, has a renminbi zone. So I think we have to recognize the radically new you know, nature of our situation. If you forced me to ask about a moment and pose the question in terms of cooperation, the thing I would warn of is the 2010 moment. The 2010 moment for me is significant because that's the moment fatally in which the G20 agreed to cooperate and to cooperate on what? To cooperate on austerity. <laughs> Cooperation comes in various shades and you know it can be as it were a Marshall Plan style opening towards a brighter future but it can also be a convergence on a very bad idea. And that's what happened in 2010 is the, you know, the, the G20 um, with South, you know, with the Chinese, for instance, allying themselves with the Germans, squeezing the Obama administration into a much tighter box than was healthy for anyone. So I think that's what we've got to guard against is a sort of false and unhelpful convergence around bad ideas. And where are you seeing positive cooperation emerge at the moment? Well, I'm a European heart and soul. I've got an English accent, but that's an accident of birth. Um, uh, I do have to say that I think what's happening in the EU, which is, you know, some, some sense old hat, it belongs to the 20th century, but nevertheless, it's a spectacular project of cooperation involving 500 million people. And the steps that are being made there, and Gozi spoke about regional cooperation, I think that's very important, are very dramatic. And we've seen over the last couple of weeks, people moving out of their skins. I mean, the move that Angela Merkel has made in the last week or two is really remarkable, even from a state's person of her stature to have been willing to make the steps towards common debt raising. And I see that extending into the possibility really of potentially a very fruitful interregional axis, which would be north-south between um, uh, Europe on the one hand, as, and, and, as and then Gozi has highlighted the really dynamic movement for cooperation that we're seeing in Africa right now. And if there's any axis of cooperation, which is crucial for the 21st century, 
of an interregional type, subglobal, but nevertheless macroscopic, it's clearly got to be Europe and Africa. I mean, if you think about the population issues, the global development issues, the migration questions, the climate issues that are posed, this is a really crucial and fruitful axis. And I'm relatively hopeful because this has been a longstanding interest in Berlin uh, uh, when they were big advocates of a, you know, a Marshall Plan for Africa. The Germans are taking the presidency of the EU. If you're looking for a bright spot, I think things are moving in Berlin and I think things, things are clearly moving in Africa and I see that as a potentially really fruitful avenue. It does involve bracketing a bunch of other things which are going on, crucially the China-America axis, but, but it's potentially, I think, a very interesting avenue. So we'll come back to the China-America axis about which there are questions from the audience. I'd like to take that thought about cooperation between the European Union and Africa back to you Ngozi you are the an envoy for the African Union um are you hopeful um would you go as far as to say you're hopeful that there will be a Marshall Plan a European Union Marshall Plan well you know there was the compact for Africa that uh, Angela Merkel also um put together a few years ago uh, I think it was during their presidency of the G20 yes, as well exactly and um, you know, and uh, that's aimed to bring the private sector and other actors into working with African countries. I, for me, I, I think that uh, we first need to look inside uh, ourselves at what we, we should do a Marshall Plan for ourselves that comes from inside. Uh, yeah, because before people help you, you have to help yourself. So, and I think it's becoming clearer and clearer what we need to do and how we are cooperating continentally. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, you know, is there and will come into force. If not for the COVID pandemic, we would have had it in force already. So hopefully by July or later, that provides a, a medium for African countries to come together with their own Marshall Plan. How do they use this pandemic as an opportunity to attract some supply chains back into Africa which will enable them to trade with Europe in, in, and cooperate with Europe, which I think is essential. Europe is one of our largest, our second largest market after, after China. How do we reinforce this around things that we can trade successfully with Europe? If we attract supply chains where we can process uh, more of our agricultural goods, not just trading commodities, because that's what's been putting us in trouble. Manufacture some of this, be able to send that to Europe and, and ha also have European goods come in as a continent. That would be very good. Um, so I, I see a future there, I believe in it, but it has to be a new type of arrangement. I don't think that we are going to cooperate along the old lines because Africa is moving wants to do things differently, wants to process its own products, wants to trade with itself and then trade with other, others. So that was quite diplomatic about, about Europe and Gozi. I mean, um, <coughs> you, you've, you've given us a, a, a great story about the African Union's cooperation in this crisis. And yeah. it's one of, the, one of the interesting things about this crisis is the way in which smaller, poorer countries seem to have done better. They've had the humility to confront the crisis earlier and, and, and more strongly than some of their wealthier, um, less humble um, partners. Mm. But, but what, do you, what do you think you can rely on the European Union to do and what do you think it won't do that it should do or that you would like it to do? Well, that's a very good question, Nairi. I, I mean, you know, as Adam said, we, what other type of cooperation would be more beneficial than that between Europe and Africa? Because we are separated from each other by just miles. Yeah. And uh, so the health cooperation, the Europeans are very willing, uh, you know, to, to do. I think they've endeavored to see what resources can be sent to the continent. Uh, although some of them close their doors to exporting medical mm -hmm. equipment and other things, we must say that. and. I think we've been telling them to open up on that. But there has been a willingness to talk about and support cooperation and to even within the ACT Accelerator insist that when we do find vaccines or therapeutics, we must make sure there's equity and access 
for developing countries, especially Africa. So that is there. I think on the economic front, though, there's a lot of good rhetoric, but it hasn't really amounted to specific action the way that we would like uh, it to be. The, the EU and, and various countries have uh, announced various amounts that they are willing to support Africa with. But these are really reallocations. We haven't seen fresh money. And during this time, what we really need is additionality. We need fresh money. We don't need what was there already for something else to be reallocated to the pandemic. Yes, in the short term, it might make a little bit of sense, but in the longer term, you need to do more. That hasn't been as forthcoming. And I want to take up one issue that Adam mentioned, which is very important, the swap lines that are available to a select and privileged group. Of course, African countries are not part of this. Mm -hmm. Why is it good? that the countries that are already rich and well-to-do have access to swap lines, but those that need it most have no access. Does this make any sense? We're saying, look, find a mechanism that can also extend the same swap lines to, to uh, you know, developing countries. Find a mechanism, and that exists. He talked about SDRs. Well, the G7 and G20 and all may not be willing to create new SDRs, but, there are already existing SDRs that are in the reserves of the G7 countries, especially of Europe. And we're saying to the Europeans, can you lend these SDRs to the IMF at some kind of low rate, which can then now pass on that liquidity in a kind of swap line arrangement to African central banks, because they can pass this on to our private sector, to our businesses in the same way that the rich countries are doing. And this is missing. This isn't being done. So I think that type of cooperation on the economic front, opening up the, the prospect to include other countries is really vital. And I say that because it's not in the interest of Europe for Africa not to recover economically. It's actually against the interest of Europe. Mm -hmm. So I would want to urge them and urge Adam and everybody who has a voice to insist on this pooling of SDRs. If we get 100 billion SDRs pooled, that can generate 24 to 30 billion or so for African countries or more. Uh, and, and, and then we can take it from there. So the picture you are both giving us all is a picture of a world where every country has some pretty tough choices coming out of COVID-19. They're indebted. Uh, the, private sector's indebted, their public sector's indebted, and then there's a small elite of countries that are going to be able to borrow, borrow from the United States, borrow from the capital markets, and they will be able, if they make the political choice so to do, they will be able to grow out of this crisis. And then you're showing us a world of all the other countries who may or may not be able to grow out of this crisis. They will only be able to grow out of this crisis if they have some access. and. So far, you've highlighted two problems. One is who will lend to them to do this? Will it be IMF, World Bank, because of expanded capacities that you're talking about? Um, to what extent are the credit rating agencies going to prevent many of those countries from having access to capital markets? That second point, Adam um, Ngozi brought up earlier, what is your take on the role that credit rating agencies will play, should play, and what can we do about that? Well, I mean, I agree with her that they are an inexplicably, um, uh, you know, um, unaccountable kind of force in global finance. They operate even within the advanced economy world to the detriment, for instance, of the weaker players in the Eurozone system. Um, the access of several members of the Eurozone to ECB support hangs on one or two downgrades. Um, the role in general, what we've seen, I mean, in March, I think we were terrified of the possibility of a complete shutdown in access, a true sudden stop. And the funding flows, many of the people in the audience will have seen the numbers. The IIF came out with the first sets of figures earlier in the year, showed a, a really abrupt funding halt. Um, and people were very anxious about South Africa's situation, which was on the edge of being downgraded from investment grade to junk. That produced a temporary, as it were, obstacle. It, it turns out that actually, as it were, having gotten over the shock of having been downgraded, South Africa actually has access to borrowing again. 
notably on domestic markets. And several large emerging market players have in fact been able to do bond issues in the face of this, in the face of what appeared to be a really savage shutdown. So I think that our most immediate fear in March, early April, that we were looking at a total sudden stop has somewhat alleviated. I think there were two types of country that are still, and this is assuming, or maybe three, that we're still really very concerned about. Um, one of the big commodity producers where the full extent of the raw material price collapse is still working its way through. And there are going to be a number of very severely hit countries there, including Nigeria, Angola, several Latin American countries in that category. Um, there are going to be large trouble spots like Turkey, which is, I think, in the eyes of many analysts, teetering on the edge of a potentially major crisis, massively compounded by politics in the sense that Erdogan's government is not willing to actually avail itself of IMF support, even if it were available. And then the third category are the low-income countries, who many of them in sub-Saharan Africa, but not just there, that face a, a, a triple shock, really, in the terms of the, the fall in prices, the fall of uh, the fall in prices of exports, the fall of remittances, and then the public health crisis that Im impacting them as well, and the capital market shutdown. And I think that's where, as it were, the most urgent concerns are about a sudden surge in poverty, uh, food insecurity, and where you know support really needs to be targeted. But that general sense of a complete collapse of you know the entire non-core world's financing, I think that's somewhat alleviated, not in any way to downplay the seriousness of the situation of those three categories. And what else needs what else needs doing? Well, I, as, as Ngozi was saying, we need to get much more serious about the uh, the debt moratorium. It needs to be extended. It needs to be generous. And as she was also very tactfully uh, commenting, it's clear that we need to strong arm the private creditors into uh, cooperating on this. Um, I think then that we do need to talk about IMF resources because some of the large emerging market cases are so large that they would stress the IMF and goes is absolutely right that there was a job there's a job to be done in terms of redistributing SDR resources within the IMF. But one of the things that launched me on my rather perhaps um, over optimistic visions of European African cooperation is that ahead of the spring meetings, it was a joint appeal by European and African leaders to the meetings for not just a redistribution, but an expansion of SDR resources. And Angela Merkel has come back to that appeal just this week. That also, I think, would send a very positive sign. It does, however, unfortunately, run into concerted opposition from the Trump administration. And that has very specific roots. In other words, the worries of people like Steve Mnuchin at the US Treasury about possible um, opposition from the very right wing of the GOP in Congress. So that is potentially a serious hot potato in Washington. Yeah, I would add to that, Naira, if I may, the, the, the objection, you're absolutely right, Adam. I mean, there's also the issue that they feel that if you create new SDRs, the way they'll have to be distributed. To, uh, to, <laughs> to Iran, Venezuela. <laughs> yeah, and China and so yeah. on. And so nobody wants them to get access to new SDRs. So yeah. there's a very strong political opposition. So I think Angela Merkel would be more very helpful. The US is not opposed to pulling the, the, the already uh, existing, uh, yeah. existing SDRs. Uh, and they're lying in the reserves of European banks, Americans, yeah. and they're not being used. So if you lend them at very low cost. Then the other thing I wanted to comment on, yes, you're absolutely right. That collapse of capital markets didn't happen. Some emerging markets actually went in and had access. But uh, you know, some of our countries, you know, that want to go in. If you look at the yields on, on, yeah, yeah. on the way, they're outrageous. I mean, why would Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa have yields in double digits at a time when people are willing to lend money to Germany at negative rates? I mean, to, to, you know, they're willing to lend money to Germany, not, not, not even, you know, I don't know how to term it. It makes yeah. no sense that yields pay on to lend money. bonds, <laughs> right, pay to hold their resources, that they have negative yields of about 0.3%, and you see yields on Nigeria of 11%, or Ghana 10%, South Africa, you know, that, that doesn't reflect the realities of the risks. And so something is going on there that I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's not fair. It blocks us. So maybe, I, 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 you know, Adam will have an answer to this. The perceived risks are too high. Yeah. So you've both, you've both highlighted that actually 
there are resources in the system there and there are ways that countries will be able to access resources, even some of the poorest countries. But of course, that's not all they need. In almost every government of the world, there is already a raging argument about whether coming out of this crisis, they should tighten their belts or whether they should try to invest in growth. So Ngozi, you've sat on both sides of this. You've been <laughs> finance minister in Nigeria trying to make decisions for the growth of the economy. And you've been managing director of the World Bank telling countries to tighten their belts. <laughs> so let me ask you the question, if you were back in a finance ministry position in another country, who would you listen to for advice? Because every <laughs> policymaker in the world is getting advice from all kinds of experts. So who would you go to for advice? Who would you listen to? Well, first of all, I would listen internally and look at my own situation and see what it needs because not one size fits all. And look, Naira, the truth is most of the economies of the world are contracting. So this is the time you need, you know, expansionary fiscal policies. Why do you think that the G7 and G20 are, are issuing fiscal stimulus in the order of eight to 10% of GDP? Some have even gone as, as big as 20%. That's expansionary. Why do you think the central banks are coming out, as Adam said, and providing liquidity lines everywhere? We don't need austerity at this moment. We, I would listen to those saying, look, you need to grow yourself back out of this trouble. So we would certainly look at the budget and see where can we reallocate from expenditures that are not so crit uh, critical to more priority expenditures in infrastructure and other areas that can really grow the economy. But on top of that, we need resources to expand. African countries have done all kinds of fiscal measures, but they won't be able to issue 0.8% of GDP fiscal stimulus about a 10th of that of the rich countries. So there's no room, they don't have the fiscal space. So clearly we need to have additional resources to expand. It's not the time for austerity. Mm -hmm. And Adam, you've gone up close to lots of financial crises. How would, you know, if one of your friends rang and said, I'm finance minister, who should I listen to? Who would you tell them to take advice from? Oh, I'm completely with Ngozi. I mean, um, this is absolutely not the moment for economy. Austerity at this moment would be fatal. In fact, we need to adjust our mindset also to thinking about the position of public debt longer term. I mean, for me, the game is not now. And I think actually there is a considerable consensus on the need to spend. My worry is about what happens 18 months from now, two years from now, where the hawkishness will really kick in and the immediate emergency will have passed. And I, and I also, uh, on top of uh, on top of infrastructure, would, would mention simply education. I mean, if there's one true catastrophe going on right now, it's the interruption of the education of literally a billion plus young people. And we need to make up for that damage. We need to double down on, on you know, that as an absolutely key area, uh, particularly, of course, in countries with, with dynamically growing younger populations. We, we, we've suffered the single largest shock to human capital formation that, um, that we've ever seen. You know, over a billion kids were, and young people were furloughed from school. So um, no, this is go, go hell for leather. And, and we did, then need to find ways basically along Japanese lines of neutralizing public debt. And we need, that's obviously a, an option for advanced economies. And we need to ensure exactly as Ngozi is saying that this doesn't become, you know, a compounder of existing inequality uh, in which the rich countries apparently don't have budget constraints and are no longer terrorized by bond vigilantes. And those further down the pecking order have to worry about every cent. Um, it, it, that, that's, that's imperative um, because otherwise this, otherwise this shock does have, I think, the capacity, and this isn't new after all, the, the gloss has come off the emerging market growth story for a while now. It's really been off since the taper tantrum of 2013. It hasn't previously taken on the dimensions of a comprehensive shock to all of the emerging markets simultaneously. It's been case by case, region by region, but look at Nigeria, look at Argentina, look at Brazil. Um, all of them have been struggling since 2014, 2015, uh, likewise South Africa. These are no longer successful, the, the successful growth stories of a decade ago. Um, and so really finding a way of restarting that growth engine is imperative. Now, it's been refreshing to have a conversation about global cooperation, which is not focused 
on President Trump and on President Xi Jinping, right? But but I but I we got to go there. <laughs> but I, well, I, I think it would be interesting to hear. So one one question from our audience, um, which you know I'll put to to you, um, Adam, first, is from Oliver Yule Smith, who asks about whether you think a swap line between the Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China would be a possibility. It's the sort of fantasy when that happens, um, we know the way in which the global financial system would evolve from here. Conceivably, seven or eight years ago, one could have imagined such an arrangement, but I'm of the view that it isn't really just politicians. There has been a deep shift in the attitude of the American government apparatus as a whole, the security apparatus, State Department, going all the way back to the Obama first term under Clinton as Secretary of State, the pivot was a real moment. And I think from then on in, the American state apparatus has begun to reevaluate its relationship with China. And that has made any such immediate fusion of the two central banks more and more unlikely, even as the entanglement of Chinese private borrowers with the dollar zone increases. So the real issue for me is how far the People's Bank and China and the Fed can organize a kind of tacit dance around each other, where they don't really admit to the degree to which they are collaborating. And Janet Yellen would, of course, go to her grave insisting there was no deal in 2015. Her decision to pull back from tightening American monetary policy did, was not directly explicitly coordinated with the Chinese. But in 2015, that's what happened. When China was last under massive pressure, the Fed did uh, aborted its tightening until the end of the year. That's the kind of cooperation on which I think we're going to increasingly rely. And it's two-sided. You know, how the Chinese manage their exchange rate is crucial for all of the emerging market economies, which are tightly connected with them, crucial for Australia. So far, the People's Bank of China has played a very cautious game in responding to this crisis. In, altogether, China has. Um, and so those are the sorts of areas of tacit cooperation, I think, that are realistic and we should look for. But you, you sound quite optimistic about that. Oh, well, that's because you're asking me about monetary policy and that dimension of policy making. And I think, you know, we need to distinguish at least four zones. Right? One is, as it were, the politicians, the Trumps, the Xi's of this world. Another are the central bankers, which I would think of as the most. They're a little bit like Ngozi's scientists, you know, vaccine cooperators. There's a common project which is managing financial stability. They're quite tightly networked. A whole other area is trade negotiation. And you have the Robert Lighthizers of this world who are banging around the world, you know, engaged in very hard nosed diplomacy. And then in the background, in every major state is, of course, the security apparatus, the military, the intelligence services who do not view the world necessarily in positive some terms. It's not their job. Their view, their view of the world is, const you know, sociologically, it's bred into them to view the world in terms of conflict rather than cooperation. And those four elements are at war with each other, sometimes you can coordinate them all. In a Marshall Plan moment, you can coordinate them, all of those different facets of statecraft, if you like, into a single vision. That's not the space that we're in at all. So the cooperation that we rely on depends, in a sense, on the incoherence of American government. Right now, I would be terrified if I thought the Fed was actually aligned with the rest of American policy. You know, there's a mercy in, in incoherence. So Ngozi, how do, how do you see this? The political world like to toss around the word decoupling, you know, with sort of gay abandon about the United States and China heading into total <coughs> fears that, that, you know, in all three areas of their strategic rivalry, they've each created their own markets and market zones. Although Adams told us actually some of those are shared even mm. in terms of the swap lines. They've each, they're each competing to outdo each other on technology although they are, of course, still dependent, although they're trying to become independent of each other in pushing forward technology. And then, of course, they're fighting over who gets to set the rules of the game. And some would say we're heading into two separate worlds and that countries such as countries in Africa are going to be forced to choose which camp they're in. Is that the world you think we're heading to? Or do you see a different pattern of both cooperation and of choices for small countries to make? Well, first of all, for the big com countries, it's absolutely true on this issue of rivalry and 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 um, tension on all all the forefronts. However, I think that there will begin to emerge a picture 
in which these countries see that they can compete and collaborate. And what we would hope is that they'll define the spheres under which cooperation is absolutely necessary because the globe needs to fix some things together and then they can compete in other areas. This is done in the private sector. You will see pr private companies that both compete and collaborate. They collaborate in certain areas to deliver a, a, a good or, or a service and they compete in other areas. I think the public sector needs to do, learn to do that. And those areas like the pandemic or climate change where there are global public goods, it's a question of the global commons. I, I would think we have to outline the two or three areas. So that's that. The second point I want to make is that developing countries, including Africa, certainly do not want to be caught in the middle of this. Um, we don't want to become pawns in any power games. And I, I, we want to be in the middle. There are countries that have succeeded in doing that. After all, Singapore has the best relationship you could think of with China and also with the US. Uh, and it's trusted by both sides. I would hope that for some of us uh, developing countries, we'll be able to have a, a position in which we can, we can work with both sides if there's going to be this kind of continued tension. We don't want to be in the middle. We can even help them build bridges towards this, each other. We are not mm -hmm. shouldn't be passive in that way. We can help, but we don't want to be pawns. So I think that it's to our advantage because we are still developing. If there are technologies or resources that are e easier uh, for us to get and cheaper from China, why not? That doesn't stop us collaborating with the US on other technologies that are also good for us to have. I, I, I want most countries that I know want to be in that situation. They don't want to be caught in between. The time of the Cold War where you were either on one side or the other uh, uh, is over. I think we're a little wiser and smarter and we are going to, <laughs> we are going to you know, there'll be arbitrage. You know, it's our time to sort out who will be with us and help us in each particular area. And, and finally, on that issue, Adam, what's the hardest bit of the China-US relationship to decouple? When it really comes down to it, if these two countries' leadership were really quite determined to go their separate ways, what's the hard rock they're going to find uh, in their way? What's the hardest thing to disentangle in the relationship? Well, they've already broached tech, which is pretty tough. Um, but I'm an academic. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged to be part of the American private university system. The single most grievous damage that would be done would be if America moved hard to remove Chinese students from the American university system. It would be a spectacular act of self-harm and a huge historic loss. Um, and there are signs that they're moving in that direction in key areas. I personally have received emails instructing me which bits of the Chinese university system I'm no longer permitted to engage in any cooperation with. There may be good or bad reasons for that. I'm in no position to judge. I'm no security expert. But watching that happen as a teacher, as an intellectual, as a university academic, watching these, you know, this antagonism extend into the classroom, into the laboratory, to the library, is the most heartbreaking and awful thing to see. And I sincerely hope that it doesn't, you know, that it doesn't come to that because it would really be a historic break. There are, I think, almost three hundred thousand Chinese students that we're fortunate enough to have in the American system, the potential you know, contribution that those brilliant people can make to the development of human capital and technology and science and the humanities is just you know, huge. They already do on a vast scale. And the idea that this could be politicized and torn apart is, is you can see, I mean, it makes me emotional. It's, it's, it's terrifying and, and infuriating and, and horrific. And which country, sorry to come back to the kind of judgment that you don't want to make, but which, which of the two countries would it damage the most? Well, I can speak about the United States, not as an American, but as a member of the university system. It would damage us profoundly. Um, 
And we right now are the beneficiaries of a rather one-sided exchange. We have their brilliant young people, their brilliant researchers in the United States more than they have our people in the in China. So right now, it seems to me it's very one-sided. I mean, we can read their publications and participate in conferences with Chinese academics, but but we 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 don't have, as it were, the same number of people from the West in the Chinese university system because of linguistic obstacles. Um, but we would be huge losers because the contribution that those people make to our lives, I don't need to tell you, is just is, is vast and, and growing and snowballing in a dramatic way. And one could imagine a future uh, of truly profound and deep in, engagement, which would be, would be a wonderful thing to see happening in the 21st century. And for that to be brought to a halt in this way, in this thuggish you know, manner, is, makes me furious. And I guess it's very important to point out that the collaboration between public health experts, for example, between China and the United States, um, between the CDC and China's CDC, between yeah. the uh, public health um, specialists at Harvard and the public health specialists in Chinese universities has been part of what has helped both countries move quickly out of this crisis. I want to finish with a question which um, some of the audience have raised. Um, which is about climate change. And I want to ask Ngozi, um, is this a moment where we have to put, you know, coming into this crisis, climate change had really become the number one goal for many in international cooperation um, because it posed an existential threat. We're now facing, for many, a more immediate existential threat. Does that mean that climate change goes on the back burner or what? Absolutely not. I mean, the the, the existential threat of climate change has not gone away. We had a temporary reprieve because of the lockdowns and economic activity, you know, sort of dying down a bit and people could see an improvement of 70, they actually measured it in our cities. I think 17% fall in carbon emissions or, or thereabouts. So um, it's still high. Uh, we can't, we actually, I think there's an opportunity in, in, in this pandemic uh, uh, to, for us, we are going to have lots of money for fiscal stimulus. In the US is three trillion already, could go to six trillion. In the developed countries, lots of money. Hopefully in the developing countries, some, not near the amount. What do we do with this? As we try to re-stimulate our economies, how do we build back better? As some are saying, I think we must build back better in a more climate conscious way. If we want to rebuild infrastructure, are we going to go back to the old way that is very dependent on fossil fuels? Or are we going to move more to renewables, even to a transition from oil and coal to gas and then to renewables? We need to do something like that. And whilst doing it, we must pay attention to what is people talk about the just transition. Because in doing this building back and trying to take account of climate change, certain things are changing. Certain sectors will have to go away and certain new ones will come up. How we manage the people involved in these transitions so that they are well treated, that's crucial. Um, so I do absolutely believe that the issue of climate change is still critical. And we should see this crisis as an opportunity to do better on climate change, not do worse. Thank you, Ngozi and Adam. Tonight we've addressed the question of will the world cooperate? And we've seen that even at a time when countries are turning inward, partly because people can't travel, partly because suddenly this crisis has shone a pretty harsh spotlight on things that are wrong in every country of the world, and so we are seeing governments turn inward. And yet I think tonight's discussion has shown us that there is not a single country in the world that will not depend upon its relations with its neighbors, with its allies, and even with those that are its strategic rivals. I'm optimistic listening to Adam and Ngozi about the ways in which even underneath the loud disagreements of politicians, cooperation is continuing, whether it's among the scientists, the medics, the epidemiologists, the vaccine creators that Ngozi is stitching together in her many roles, or whether it's among the central bank governors and central bank staff and officials, 
um, and the finance sectors that Adam has described for us. At the same time, I think we're left with a very strong feeling that there's a lot on the knife edge at the moment, that, that countries are going to, they both need the resources to grow out of this crisis, but they also need the advice and strength to make the choices which will enable them to grow out of this uh, crisis, that many are being presented with a playbook which says, just try, you know, just try to tighten the belt, you no longer have the resources. And we're asking a lot of our political leaders around the world to raise up their sights, to do more at home, and in order to do more at home, to be more abroad. Can I thank you all? Can I thank the participants tonight for their outstanding questions? And we will keep the question and answer column so that anyone that, that, so that our speakers tonight can reflect on it afterwards because you've made some fabulous points. And could I thank on behalf of all of you, Professor Adam Tooze and Dr. Ngozi Okonjiweala for joining us and educating us for a fantastic hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Naira. Thank you.